Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Death Row channel. Today we're going to talk about an author whose works have entertained me since the early 1990s. He is a retired math and computer science professor from the University of San Diego. He's written quite a few short stories and only a few novels though, but the books he has written are fairly remarkable. In particular, his later works are groundbreaking and thought-provoking and have won a number of awards. The name of the author is Werner Vinge. Now you may not have heard of Werner Vinge, and you should have. I mean, it, it seems like he should be a lot more famous than he is. A lot of people will say, Vinge, that sounds familiar. I've heard of an author by that name, but it wasn't Werner. Well, there's a Joan D. Vinge, who was his wife at one time. They are divorced amicably, and she kept his name probably because she was already known under that name. And she writes fantasy. She's quite prolific. She's got over 20 novels out there. So I have read only one of those, I believe, The Snow Queen. It was pretty good, but I'm not as much of a fantasy person, so... Maybe at some later time I'll read some more and review her stuff as well. Interestingly enough, her new husband, uh, James Frankel, uh, had a small publishing outfit that published some of Werner's books. <laughs> so it's nice that they're, you know, getting along. Anyway, as I was saying, Werner is not as well known as he should be. There's several reasons for that. First of all, he wrote one of the very first books that defined cyberspace in a fictional way. Way before William Gibson and all those other cyberpunk writers. <clears throat> this was in 1981 and the, the book was called True Names and I have not read it. I guess it's just a novella. But it actually won some awards. And I wasn't even aware of that until just recently. He also popularized the idea of the singularity. And this is kind of a scary prediction that computers and machine intelligence will become so powerful that they'll overwhelm humanity and maybe take us over or wipe us out. But the name singularity comes from the idea of a black hole as a singularity. And a black hole has such heavy gravity that nothing can escape. No light can escape. So the idea of a technical historical singularity is that it's such a big change that no information can filter back to us to predict it. We have no way of knowing. It's an interesting metaphor. So, for those reasons, he should definitely be more well known. And he has won a number of fabulous awards, so, so I'm sure there are those of you out there in the sci-fi community who have heard of him, who have read him. But again, not as many as there should be. I have read just four out of his eight novels, and those are the ones I'm going to talk about. And those are among my favorites. The others, some of them were earlier, and some of them were not as well received. And I'll probably get around to reading them at some later time. I've also read some of his short stories, which I did enjoy, but I'm not going to focus on them. Now, he wrote his first short story, or published his first short story, in 1965. He was born in the 1940s, uh, so he was just, I think, a little pre-boomer, and so he wrote a lot of stories in the 60s and 70s and so on, in the 80s is when he started getting into the longer works, and when in the 90s is when he really started winning awards. That groundbreaking story, True Names, won a Prometheus Award, which is a pro-freedom, pro-liberty award given by libertarian sci-fi fans, which is one of the reasons that I became attracted to the works of Benji, because I heard he was well regarded by people who appreciate freedom. Werner Vinge has two kind of major series that incorporate big ideas, and those are the ones I'm going to talk about. The first is the Real Time series, and there are two books in that that were later published as a collection, and the second is the Zones of Thought series. There are two that I've read, and a third published in 2011 that I wasn't aware of but I am going to get a copy as soon as I get my next Audible credit. <laughs> so, starting with the real-time series. These each have a big idea. In this case, the big idea is how 
technology can impact the political world of humanity. A group of scientists at Lawrence Livermore Labs invent a force field that they call a bobble. They call it that because it's a, like a bubble. It's like a shiny bubble and nothing can penetrate it. It's completely spherical and they become more and more adept at creating these such that they finally get a way to create one that's permanent. It seems to be permanent. It seems to like maintain itself forever without any input of energy. I think that's how it went. And when the 2040s roll along, you know, the world is in danger of all these possible nuclear wars and so on, and these scientists say, you know what, we could change that. We could save the world. We have this technology, we can put a force field around every major military installation in the world. All sides, <laughs> we're going to shut it all down. And that's what they do. You know, every place in the world, America, Russia, Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, they're all being shut down. And this pretty much causes all these governments to collapse. I mean, they can't enforce their will on the people or on their neighbors. And in their place, there is the peace authority, which is what these scientists have formed. It's a de facto, very laissez-faire world government. <laughs> and their only rule is that you can't develop any technology that threatens the order. <laughs> so if you do, they'll bobble you. <laughs> and at the time, they think that that effectively kills the person inside because you don't have any air or light coming in. And so in this world there are you know various organizations that arise kind of like private companies to help prevent crime. And so it's a much more libertarian uh, anarchist, anarcho-capitalist way of ruling the world. Which a lot of us see as pretty positive. If it can be pulled off, that's the question. So the first story is called uh, it's called the Peace War and involves this this conflict. It was published in 1984 by Blue Jay Books, which was James Frankel's company. How cool! How cool is that? Your ex-wife's husband. <laughs> the next book is called Marooned in Real Time, which is a later development. Some people discover that eventually some of these baubles start to pop, which means that they just go away at random times and they discover the people inside are not dead, they have been suspended. Time has not passed at all, not even a microsecond. So they're still alive, and they wonder, what's going on here? And their technology of those military bases is like 50, 60 years out of date, so they're not any threat. But it's an interesting possibility now. Some people think, well, we could be time travelers. We can put ourselves in a bobble, we can design it to you know, pop in 100 years, and we can see what the future is like. So that's what they do. And they go into the future and they see you know, all the great advances of the, of the 22nd century and you know, how humanity is peaceful and long-lived and all these wonderful things. And in the 23rd century, when they keep making these hops, in the 23rd century they discover mankind is gone. And there's no way they can go back. It's a one-way time travel. And they can't figure it out. There's no, there's no evidence of nuclear war. Did they get absorbed into the singularity? Did they uh, get killed by the singularity? Did they build a spaceship and leave? They don't know. But so it's a central mystery of Marooned in Real Time, of that story. Now the name refers to a case where somebody apparently uh, pushed somebody, one of the crew members, outside of one of the baubles and she got left behind, essentially abandoned to die in a place without any humans. So that's another mystery, like who did it? There was a third story that got stuck in the middle uh, in that later edition, in a 1991 edition, because they were collected in this book called Across Real Time, which is how I read them, and that was published in 1986 and later in 1991 with a new story added by Bain Books. This third story was called The Ungoverned, which was a story that takes place during the Peace Authority's reign, and it involves a conflict between New Mexico, the protection company, and Kansas that plays out kind of interestingly. The next group I'm going to go into is the zones of thought. And this is a, kind of a bigger, more profound idea. And the idea is that the galaxy has different zones where the constants of nature are somewhat different. Because of the gravity of all these stars, they affect the way that chemical reactions proceed and the way electrons move and so on. So in the inner galaxy with all that gravity of all those stars, 
It's slower. And that means that intelligent life cannot exist. You know, everything's dumb. You know, no, no, no thought at all. It's called the mindless deaths. In our zone, it's as we know it. There's intelligent life, but there's limits. In the outer rim of the galaxy, these thoughts can spill over outside the physical body, so we have things like uh, telepathy and, and uh, psychic abilities and creatures that can form co cooperative intelligences and can kind of become godlike in some cases. First book in this series is called A Fire Upon the Deep. This was published in 1992 by Tor Books, which is surprising because these days Tor is such a left-wing, politically correct company, I can't imagine them publishing somebody like Werner Vinge. <laughs> but those were the good old days. And it's an interesting book, uh, Fire is. It involves some humans crash landing on a world in the outer zone where there's more psychic ability. They meet this society called the Tyne, which, like the Tynes on a fork, they are intelligent dogs. But they are pack intelligences. That is, you have four or five creatures together as one mind. You separate a creature out, it just becomes an animal. You take that creature away, they become a little dumber. And so they eventually have to replace that creature, you know, maybe have another baby or whatnot. Almost effectively immortality. But they have this uh, medieval society and they have these different clans. So these humans are crashed on there and this rather warlike clan discovers them and kills all the adults and takes these two children, uh, Jeffrey and Johanna, as prisoners. And so they have to try and, and get away and survive and maybe find a friendlier group of time. There's another, another theme going on at the same time, which gets more into the singularity idea, is that some humans have discovered these AIs that have become super powerful, and one is kind of taking everything over, and they call it the Blight. This Blight has gotten off world, and it's going to threaten this world of the time. A Fire Upon the Deep won the Hugo Award, one of the most notable sci-fi awards in 1993. It was nominated for the Nebula Award, the Campbell Award, and the Locus Awards. So very well off. <laughs> you know, very well regarded. Next book in the series, A Deepness in the Sky, 1999 Tor. Tor books. Now this was the one that won all the awards. <laughs> it won the Hugo Award, the Campbell Award, and the Prometheus Award, that is the Pro Liberty Award, and it was nominated for the Nebula, the Clark, and the Locus. <laughs> so, oh my God, that, there's not many books that have gotten that much high regard. This book is about a world of intelligent spiders. <laughs> um, but it's more than that, it's also about two computing groups of human that come into conflict. Now, the spider world, they're intelligent spiders, they're like large, like think dog size or whatever, it's sort of creepy, but he makes them kind of human-like. They have a kind of 20th century technology, so they're developing atomic power, so they're in danger of waking themselves up, but they also have this unique star that turns on and off, and I guess that's a real thing, but very rare. So in this case, the star is shining, producing energy for like 30 years, and then it's off for like 100 or more. So all life forms have to go into hibernation, go to seed or hide into the ground. When the sun comes back on, there's this furious radiation, there's this tremendous heat and radiation that's going to kill everything unless you're hiding underground, which is what the spiders do. And they have buildings and so on that can survive this conflagration. They are plotting against each other, all these different nations, and one group of spiders says, you know what, we could stay awake when it's frozen, have nuclear power, to keep us warm and attack the other guys while they sleep. In the midst of this plotting, there is a group of humans called the Cheng Ho, a group of explorers and traders. Cheng Ho was a Chinese admiral from the 1400s here on Earth, and the emperor sent him out to explore, and he did. came back with all these wonderful tales. So this is what the Cheng Ho, they are peaceable traders. They want to acquire information, they want to give information, they're just out to learn and be good. 
essentially in a libertarian fashion. Whereas the emergence, the other people, they're like totalitarian and they are enslaving other countries, other, other planets, and they just want to exploit the spider's world for their minerals. And as far as they're concerned, if they can induce the spiders to wipe each other out in nuclear war, almost the, so much the better. <laughs> so they're evil. And so there's this conflict between the two groups while they're in orbit, like negotiating with the spiders. Oh, well, the emergence betray the Cheng Ho essentially, kill a bunch of them, enslave the rest with this mind virus. Now the name of Deepness in the Sky is pretty cool because the deepness is what the spiders call their hidey holes that they go into during the winter time, during when the star is off. Deepness in the sky means the spaceships. And it's a good analogy, a good metaphor. That's how they understand what a spaceship is. So one of my favorite female characters, I think her name was Kiwi, although I may be confusing her with another character, but she was taken as a sex slave by one of the emergence, and, and he kind of wiped her memory to make her think that the emergence were the good guys and that the Cheng were the bad guys, but she had such a strong personality, it kept coming back. She kept remembering, he kept having to wipe her. So I found her very inspirational. At the same time, there was another female character who was made a slave as under the focus, and she could only work on particular things. And I remember her uh, with interest, too. Now, I saw a feminist review of this. <laughs> I tend to not read reviews until after I've made my notes, so I don't want to prejudice myself. But this gal thought that Kiwi was not a strong character because, you know, a man helped save her. And But nonetheless, I think these these women definitely had a lot of strength of character to have persevered through these horrible times. So I totally enjoyed this book. Fantastic. Third book is called The Children of the Sky, published 2011, also by Tor. I'm going to get a copy of the other book as soon as I have another credit, which is very soon. So now pros and cons, quickly, because I'm running out of power here. <laughs> pros, they were groundbreaking novels, a lot of amazing concepts, mind-blowing in some cases. The world building was fantastic, as well as the setup of the alien races and their different societies that depended upon how their worlds were. I really found the themes of freedom of just and justice to be very inspirational. As far as the cons go, yeah, some of the characters were a little bit wooden, especially in the first, the real-time series. Some of them were tropish, you know, like a young science wizard. You know, he doesn't have that much of a personality. But it was still a great story, and this is the real-time series, not so much the uh, Zones of Thought series. The pacing is a problem for some people. They're really, really long books, as far as audiobooks, especially the Zones of Thought stuff. And I don't mind, and I listen to them at 130%, so it's less long, but it's still enjoyable. And finally, I found some of his stuff to be a bit depressing, especially marooned in real time. It's horribly sad to think of the human race dying out, but, you know, we have to think about that. It might happen if we don't play our cards right. As far as ratings, I would give the Across Real Time Compendium, that single volume that combines those two novels in a story, four and a half out of five years. Very good stories, but, you know, the characters weren't quite as good and it was more of a showcase of ideas. Still great, great, highly recommended. The Zones of Thought, both of those books, A Fire Upon the Deep, A Deepness in the Sky, fantastic, five out of five gears. Even the titles are fantastic, I love them. And highly recommended. By the way, I don't usually do this, but this time I'm adding this bit to a video that I actually recorded a couple weeks ago. That's because I wanted to do a review of the third book in this trilogy, which I hadn't yet read. So this book is Children of the Sky, third book in these Zones of Thought series. It's a direct sequel to the number one book in the trilogy, A Fire Upon the Deep. It takes place on Tyne's world. There's a world populated by intelligent dog packs. <laughs> yes, they look a lot like dogs, and they are intelligent only in a group, like a group of like four to eight members. And I had thought that it was telepathy, but no, it's ultrasound. That's the way that they communicate and they think. So it's 
funny because they think it's strange that humans can think silently. The heroes of this book are the young Johanna and Jeffrey Olson Dot, who were stranded on this world when their ship was fleeing the Blighter fleet. The Blight is this crazy ancient AI that's aiming to wipe out and destroy humanity. And when they reached this world, they were also attacked by some of the locals. Killed all the adults but one, and they killed about half the children who were stored in these suspended animation coffins. But later on, uh, the kids and the one adult, whose name is Ravna, built a village around the old crashed spaceship and the castle of the good queen, Woodcarver. And so she's friendly to humans and uh, they are getting along, they're building this society and village together. I expected this story to be about the confrontation between the humans and the blight, but it wasn't. This book has a lot about the conflicts between the different groups of humans, uh, some backstabbing and conspiracies and, and uh, intrigue, and the different, essentially, time packs, <laughs> some of whom are remnants of the old packs who were attacking the humans before. This book has got some really fantastic world building, some, some memorable characters, you know, likable or hateable, which is both good. It's got an gripping, exciting intrigues and adventure. Its only major flaw is it's really long, <laughs> which means that the pacing is a little slow in places. But, nonetheless, it's very good. I do recommend it. Benji does leave room for a sequel. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen. He's getting on in years. and It's been over 10 years since he wrote this one. I would rate this one 4.5 out of 5 years. The only thing I'm deducting for is the length and, and pacing. So that's been my review of the works of Werner Benji. That is his more notable works, the ones that won a bunch of awards. And please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please like and subscribe because we need to get out the good steampunk word. I would also love it if you would check out my works on Amazon. So for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, I just amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.